I start on it. It's perfect. Okay, we should. We, we are live now. We should do a sound check for the online guys. Uh, can you ask them? Do you have chat, uh, the, the Zoom chat? Yes. Uh, can you ask them if their sound is okay? I hear sound, says Young Wei. Okay, this is Conrad here. I'm just testing. Awesome. We're live. Shall we get started? Uh, okay, everyone, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to disturb all the cool discussions. Today, we're again trying something new. We're trying a very different format. Interactive. Interactive format. We're going through lots of deep learning riddles to just see how you're thinking about it and to just practice thinking a little bit. We do, and, and we'll be tag teaming, Lyle and me. He didn't know about that before, to, before like five You'll minutes ago. You'll be nodding. I'll be heckling. <laughs> You'll be nodding. Um, let's first get uh, some admin. So some people complain that like the class would be too time intensive. Um, we, therefore, uh, we therefore did a check. Our goal originally was that it would take you about 12 to 13 hours per week. Um, we looked at the self-reported weekly workload, including everything, lecture time, part-time, homework, worksheets, all that. Average was 11.5 hours and median was 10 hours. So what that means is that on average, we are like right on target. You're working as many hours as we wanted you to, and as was the design criterion here. But some of you are putting in crazy amounts of hours. If you're like of that group of like taking more than 15 hours or something, you definitely need to see us. You know, like it shouldn't take so long. If it does so long, we should talk about why it's taking so long um, and we should see what we can do about it. And everyone's situation is going to be different. There. So please reach out. Like, seriously, I love hearing from you. I love talking about it. I love thinking about like what solutions can be for that. I want you to learn about deep learning. We want you to learn about deep learning. We feel the skills will be useful for you, and that's why, why it's a modern anchor. Uh, reach out to either me, your squad leaders, or Lido from that. So whoever you feel like most comfortable talking to, please do that. Because that's super important. We don't want you to use the support. And like putting in, like, as I said, 50 more, 50 plus hours a week. This is way too much. So just to repeat Anka's point for people who couldn't acoustically hear that, contact. Whoever you're most comfortable contacting with, talk with your TA, talk with Anka, talk with Lyle and me. We, we are open, we really like hearing from you. Cool. Um, let's. Um, Questions? Yeah. Mike, you expect us to click on all the links to the papers and look up all the terms that you kind of mentioned. Okay, here's a, here's a great question, just to repeat it. Uh, do we expect you to look up all the terms and all the concepts that are mentioned at some level? There's in a way two different things that are part of the worksheets. There's the core things the skills that we actually practice, the kinds of things for which you'll do coding. We expect you to understand what's going on there. However, there's also this thing where we give you pointers of like, there's also this literature, there's also this, there's also this concept. We don't expect you to follow up and like go and like read up everything. Now, if you see your future is doing deep learning, you better kind of do all that. And yes, if you see this as the future for your scientific career, you will probably spend more than 10 hours because while well, you're preparing yourself for a future career and like, that's okay. And like, if you're super excited about it and you just read everything you can find, all the original papers and so forth, yeah, that's gonna take more than 10 hours. And, but that's not something that we expect you to do. It's something that I think is very cool. And if anyone has questions about like, you wanna read papers in some area, like, yeah, email me, I'll be, I'll, I'll link you to more papers than you realistically want to read. And it won't be on the final exam because? Um, 
uh, what do you mean? <laughs> there is no final exam. Oh, there was, there's no final exam. Nope. Did, did, did we announce there will not be a final exam? But in case you're wondering, they have to, the optional papers are optional and will not be on the final exam. It doesn't exist. <laughs> Which means that the non-optional things are also not on the final exam. <laughs> okay, great. While we're talking about talking, several project groups have reached out to me to ask about, hey, could I talk about the final project and we'd like to do something publishable or whatever? And the answer is, you should be feeling more than comfortable, encouraged to reach out to Conrad, me, anybody to talk about the final projects. We are super eager to. I've been bad about not blocking out time, but I have been meeting actively with people in the class and you're welcome to email too. But, but the idea is that we wanna be formalized about it and that's- We will, but people already are setting up appointments to talk about it. Which, which, is cool. which, which is great, but what we will be doing very soon is we'll set up like blocks on Calendly and, and we will, we will all of you. And we expect every single group to come see us about the projects. But that means that the groups first need to have time to talk and think about it themselves. Now, if you come to us and like, uh, I want to do something NLP, then we can't help you much. Or if it's something like, I want to do something in NLP by pre-training a network with the following ideas and then domain adapting to like movie titles or something. Then but, we can but, but be very helpful. Fear, you'll fear to reach out earlier. I've nixed a couple of ideas. There's no, I think that won't work. <laughs> great. Uh, late feedback, late feedback, more feedback. Okay, great. So, but, but I want you to start thinking seriously about good projects. I want all of you to start having ideas about it. What is it that you want to do? What are the interesting things? What's doable? Now, like we went through the logic of these projects. I want to see you kind of intellectually go through that path, like roughly at this time. So how's it going? Who, who feels they have a clear idea what they'll do as project? Who feels that they have at least some idea of which branch of deep learning they want to do something? Okay, so whoever doesn't, isn't yet at that level, you should really start thinking about it. Um, you didn't share the screen. I did not share the screen. Well, that's a bit of a problem. Sorry, online audience, if you, my screen was not visible there. Share. And there, there we are. Cool. Great. Okay. Uh, what about teaming? Who, who's found people who are interested in similar things? Who has talked with people to see if they might be interested in similar things? Okay, you should all be at that stage where you're talking with people now. It, it really like projects, like in general, anything that's related to science and research, there's something about the human mind that while you do other things, you like advance intellectually on it. You need to get it started, otherwise you'll cram everything in the short period of time and it won't be great. Um, cool, oh yeah, uh, there's, there's a slide that I thought I added, which apparently I didn't, which is, what is next week? It's spring break. Hooray! What does that mean? It means the clock is effectively stopped for the entire week. Nothing is due on the week. Everything is due as if that work, if that week had never happened. All the, all the deadlines, everything is just as if the week didn't happen. So there's no complicated rules about it. Cool, let's talk about ConvNets. Now, like, uh, what did we have? We talked about transfer learning a little bit. Everything that we do, almost everything we do in a way is transfer learning these days. Which is sad, but we should talk about that another time. Why is it happy? Because that's the only way, I need to go over close the microphone. The only way you can actually really learn enough is by doing transfer learning. And the only way that humans are so incredibly good at learning is because we've spent an insane amount of time as babies playing with stuff and looking at stuff and acquiring a general background knowledge. So with the only way to learn the world is not by doing labeled supervised things, it's by actually transferring from having one thing to something related. But Otherwise, I mean like- Learning is hopeless, it's too hard. But I come from a discipline, neuroscience, where we kind of, everything we needed, we had on the table and all the analysis we did like right next to it. It, it felt like it was owning the whole thing. With these pre-trained models, it's like, 
Google run some stuff? Do I really understand everything they do? No, I don't. Like, I'm dependent on these guys now. Yeah, and if you want stuff to work, you're going to, in some sense, the whole problem of all of deep learning is transfer learning. There's only one problem in deep learning. It's how do you take self-exploration, self-supervised, see the world, and use that for the tiny number of examples you actually get labels on. That's a great point. Guys, why is all of deep learning about transfer learning? I just said that. You all were like nodding nicely. Why? Yeah. Because only an experienced certain company has the power to like train in the finances to train models intensely. And then if you want to personally use those models, you have to like reapply them to our specific field. So the claim is that only industry has the resources to train big models. I but mean, that's that's on set. I'm gonna disagree. <laughs> right? I think it is. To many things, it is the case that the Googles and Baidus of the world have more resources than we do, for sure. And we use that. But I think we will see in the next 10 years lots of other transfer learning. It's not just taking the mega model trained on these giant data sets, that we're taking smaller, more manageable models trained on only millions of examples and transferring them to the 10 or 20 examples one has in place. So I think it's more general even than the. Than What's true, right? Of course, you're right. The big companies have more data than we do. But I think it goes beyond that, which is you just don't see enough examples of any one thing. You're trying to recognize um, Mars 13 and lemonade, and you just don't see enough. That's the first time in my life I've ever seen a monster tea and lemonade. Yeah, there was a truck that gave that to for free for me on the way yeah. here. Here's the cool thing as a human you see one of those and you say, Conrad, that's a blicket. And Conrad's are really good at other humans that say, ah, is this a blicket? Uh, nah, not no, so much. No, you're not going to drink that blicket. Ah, no <laughs> blicket, right? One shot so, learning. We're, we're amazingly good at it. And a lot of deep learning now is trying to move toward that two shot learning. Yeah, and everything that humans do is kind of analogical in a way. We've, we're, we're always generalized from a different thing. So, like, yeah, human behavior is characterized by transfer law. So, I'm actually totally mm -hmm. with Lyle. Despite all the hard time I was giving him. Uh, so so let's, let's briefly review what we learned this week. Uh, we talked about transfer learning, which is the core of virtually everything that works these days. We talked about the historic continents. Um, and we can reuse them for a lot of your class projects. You will take one of the historic continents and somehow reuse it to something cool new with it. And that I think is super important. And then we talked about like a little more advanced networks like mobile net and face nets, and you get to play with them a little bit. You get the intuitions on why they work. That was last week. Uh, yeah, here's spring break. Well, that's the wrong place. So what's coming ahead? We'll be talking about generators of images, autoencoders, GANs. These th things are awesome because it looks just so super cool. Like if you have a GAN produce faces, lots of faces you've never seen before. So that's super cool. At the same time, it's less clear what, apart from writing scam, scam reviews, what the real commercial or scientific applications of GANs are. Well, although generators in language are, we'll cover these in two weeks, the hottest thing there. Microsoft thinks it's worth a billion dollars to be able to generate text and to generate code with an auto generator, not an image generator, but text code or human text. So yeah. they think it's a billion dollars. Yeah, yeah, but it's Which not I vision. Right. I mean, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm with them. Not like question answering. Sure cool, but, but I think the idea that you, we've done lots of classification. Is it the face or is it an elephant? We haven't done a lot of generation. Yeah, and at least in my world, NLP, generation is where it's all, all about the uh, generation. Yes. It's super cool. Uh, that's, that's right, which probably means that in future years, we should put more text into that specific, uh, into that specific components. Yes. Um, I have a question. How do we create like a benchmark for generation? Uh, like there's attributes, there's a lot of attribution, but there's no really benchmark for how good something 
That's generators, right? Well, they are vectors. Sure how good a generation is, and the dirty secret of a lot of actual deep learning, lots of things are not just auto generated, but almost everything, there's two forms of metric as we're thinking about in a project. One's a computer metric. Take the images that were generated and give them to a classifier and have them classify them. The other is a human metric. Take the images and give them to a human and have the human say on a scale of one to seven, where seven is awesome and one sucks, label it. It's not horribly bad to take a hundred images from something and a hundred images for something else at say three seconds an image. You could label all of them in less than a half hour. So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of human evaluation. In the end, that is for me the gold standard of most things. You're going to show the images to humans in the end, not to computers, usually, right? Unless you're doing adversarial attacks. So think but, always of the computer metric and always of the human metric. But there are more direct ways to look at how good generation is. Like if I have text that's being translated, I might have an actual label data set where I have the same text in both languages. There's a whole bunch of books that exist in more than a language. So, uh, yeah, but it's tricky then because you say, is that translation different? Sure. Is it better or worse? Uh, yeah, but I would want a model to assign high probability to the translation that the human did. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Today is going to be a weird lecture, and uh, I think it's going to be a fun lecture. We will go just through a large set of vignettes of prompts. I'll ask you to solve it. We'll solve it together. And then we'll talk about the real paper doing it. And some of the cases you may have seen before. I'm just, this is going to be more of a, replica, uh, a repetition. And some topics will be totally new. And I want to see you think like a, like a deep learning data scientist. And remote people can play too. I'll be watching the chat window. Yes, and it's very important for the remote please, people to please. watch as uh, participatory to participate as well. Join us. So let's first have a few of them on cost functions. This is a neuroscience example. What do we have here? So we have on this axis here, we have time. On this axis, we have neurons. There's nine neurons in this case. We have spikes coming in like this. Every tick mark here would be a spike. Now, so what we have in your science there, for, we have matrices that are mostly filled with zeros, which means no spike, and then in some places there's spikes. Say so these are 10 neurons, uh, nine, nine neurons whose activity we have. Let's say the input that we have is 100 by 100 pixels. And what we want to, know, to have is a system that predicts this based on this input video that we have there. How would you set it? What would be the right cost function here? Yeah. Um, I, uh, like, what does the theta bar mean versus the n bar? Because what does what mean? Like thicker line versus. Oh, if it looks like a thick line, it just means that we have two spikes that are right next to one another. Now, this graph is very simple. It takes the index of every spike that happened and draws a line there. And of course, if there's enough spikes happening in a short period of time, you will basically, they will superimpose making it the broader bar. I think the last question would just be like, uh, this kind of as an image, like make this an image and see how they're going to be good pixelized from the actual, like two labels. Uh, yeah, we could say a good way of having a cost function would be predict which pixel is going to be blue versus which pixel is going to be not blue. Everyone agree that that's the right way of doing it? Yeah. The, the cross entropy loss. Yeah, we could use the cross entropy loss. Between what and what? So... So spikes happen in continuous time. And like, let, let's, let's just back up a little bit. Every spike happens basically at a given point of time on the time axis. But you've discretized them on the clock. Well, it's the nature of, uh, of, uh, of screens, that everything on a, on a computer screen is dig digitized to a pixel. Yeah. So what's the output? Is it the binary bit or is it the original player? 
Oh, that's a great question. Like, this is what, we, what is actually measured, apart from the fact that, like, time is discretized more. And, and you just mentioned firing rates. Um, so, so, so in neuroscience, there's this idea that there's an underlying firing rate and that the spikes are sampled relative to that, where you can say at every point of time, the neuron has a certain propensity to make spikes. And that propensity might depend on the, on the input. So, so, so how would we get from spikes that lie in continuous time to uh, something like firing rates? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that sounds exactly right. So let's see how would we phrase that. Now let's say we have a firing rate. Firing rate, let's call that lambda. We have lambda of t. And, and now what would be the rate cost function for that? No, and, and hold, on, hold on, let, let me just make sure that everyone sees why we're doing that. Um, this, is a, this is a case from neuroscience. But wherever you do machine learning, the cost functions are never given to you on a silver, uh, uh, on a, on a silver platter. Like your company, you sell something, you have a stream coming in where people like order goods. And all you can say is how many people bought my widget as a function of time. And I might also believe that there's like an underlying like widget attractiveness. Like maybe someone just said it on Twitter that this is a great project or something. And so or how many people arrive at your website per second, but you're missing some sort of smoother. I don't I like I would have a Gaussian process or something with a with a your lambda of t somehow managed to go from discrete to continuous in a window, right? That's right, yeah. How would how would we do that? What's the right window? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we might expect that we can't have more than one spike per time unit, in which case we might want the sigma there. Okay, but let's, let's think through that. Now, what would we do? We need it as we need counts. Now, like if we have continuous time, things are going to be difficult. Now, there's two possibilities that I could have. I could either have a model that does continuous time, maybe with Gaussian kernels or something. Or alternatively, I can take that matrix and discretize it and replace it with a matrix that contains the counts. Yes. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Okay, here we have. Um, that, that, that sounds wonderful. Here we have the Ponson likelihood, the probability of getting K spikes with lambda is lambda to the k e to the minus lambda over k factorial. Now, let's be clear what we'll be having for that. We'd be having a matrix where we have here for each of the neurons, we will have counts, maybe zero here, three counts here, zero here, and so on and so forth. The whole matrix is going to be filled with integers. What we would want our model is to fill that matrix with firing rates. There will be some model where we will have that this lambda of t is some parametrized function of the input of, uh, of, uh, of x, where x is this here would be the stimulus, whatever is shown to the animal. This thing here could alternatively be the number of mentions on Twitter or if Opera Winfrey tweeted him, <laughs> talked about it, anything like that, no? We will have this, which would be our K matrix, and we will have another matrix, which comes out of our model, where it would say, well, the model expects 0 0.3 spikes here and maybe 3.6 spike here, and so on and so forth. Now, if we have two such matrices, and we have the Poisson likelihood that you see here, how would I calculate the loss given those two? Right, like here I have the matrix of lambdas 
Now, the matrix of counts. How do I get from those to the likelihood? No, I, I, to be clear, no, like I have an input X. It goes through some neural network with multiple layers. Out comes, out comes a lambda. What, what is this lambda? Well, it's going to be a matrix. No? Like we will have to, for every value in our discretized matrix, predict how many counts we should be expected. Okay, now if we have those two, lambda and K, and there you have the Poisson. What's the probability of, not like this would be what we have up there is for an individual data point. We got K. We were expecting lambda. Um, so in reality, no, these are matrices, lambda I, ij and kij. Now, what would be the last function here? If, if we want to calculate the, uh, if we want to calculate the likelihood here. Yes, we can. So we will have lambda ij to the power of kij uh, e to the minus lambda ij divided by kij factorial. That would be, but that's for a given ij. Now, what happens if we go over all the ij? What's the likelihood there? Yeah. Most suddenly. No, that's why we calculate the loss. We might want to have that the loss is the likelihood. Would we, would we be using the loss, the likelihood? Does that make sense? No, it feels, yeah. Yeah, that's right. This should be negative, uh, negative likelihood. Uh, good, good point. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm a physicist. I never get science. Uh, great, great for spotting it. Okay, so, so we have this. Now, what would we have there? We want to calculate the likelihood. Do we have? No, we need to sum our product. Would this be sum our product? Hmm? Yeah, that's, that's right. As loss, we will usually use log probability. And the log probability is then, now here we would have product if we went directly for the likelihood. Uh, instead, log likelihood will have the sum. That's why we always use it. That's one of the reasons. There's another one we'll get to. No, and then we have the log of this. The log of this is kij log lambda ij minus lambda ij. Um, now, the K, I, uh, K factorial, do we need to worry about this? No, it's a constant. It's not something that my model can make better or worse. It's just like a property of this matrix. So who cares what it is? Okay, now this thing is something we can optimize. And that's what people do. And, oh yeah, hold on, one more thing. Why would we never do this? Why, why would we never use something like that as the lock uh, uh, to optimize? Why would we never implement that in PyTorch? Yeah, that's right. If you, we multiply lots of things, it's either going to be effectively infinity in our representation or zero. So it's not very helpful. Great point. Great. So what I just told you is, in fact, what the bulk of the computational neuroscience literature has been doing. Here's a famous paper in neuroscience. So it turns out that if you have a very simple way of doing this, doing this thing here, which is just a linear model followed with an exponential. Now, why would we want an exponential? Because firing rates can't be negative and the log of negative numbers just wouldn't help us here. It could be zero. So um, uh, they, they do a linear function, then an exponential to produce positive. No, like we, the counts can only be on the positive half of the axis. 
So what they do is they take a linear function, then an exponential, and then they optimize this loss function on the output. Now, basically, lambda here, let's be clear here, in the model that a lot of people use, they say lambda of t is basically w transpose x times, and we have exp of this. And this produces positive numbers, and that's what people use there. So this is what was standard in your science. So if you want, in terms of neural networks, it's just a single layer neural network with a linear thing, an exponentiation, and a parser output. Now, well, once it works on linear, of course, it will also work on multiple, uh, on multiple layers. No? And you, you, you will generally get an advantage for that. Here's some analysis from my, own, from my own lab. You have the linear models. They do really bad at, at uh, calculating things. You don't actually optimize for R squared, but you can test on it because that's the number neuroscientists are used to. And it helps a great deal to use neural networks, including feedforward neural networks or GRUs, LSTMs, all the good things that you learn during this course. It's the same cost transition people were using before. The only difference is that you now use a neural network to do your, effect, your effective regressions. Cool. Now here's a very different question. You want to know uncertainty of an artificial neural network. For example, let's say you want to estimate the location of an atom in a chemical molecule. And I want my classification to tell me where it thinks, my system to tell me where it thinks the atom is and how sure it is about it. No, that seems like a, or alternatively, I wanna predict the spectrum, whatever it is. It's a problem that can happen anywhere and that matters a great deal machine learning. Uh, I can get deep learning to give me an estimate. It's quite good at it. But hey, can I also ask it to tell me how sure it's about it? And the statisticians go bonkers about this. You should never give a point estimate. I think it'll cost ten thousand and five dollars, and it's missing what? Um, Uncertainty on the ten thousand and five dollars, right? Uh, that's that's right. No, and so like in general, it's sort of a horrible sin of machine. All the machine learning, we care about the estimate, but we never give uncertainties in the field, which drives my friends in statistics bonkers. <laughs> they think we're crazy. Okay, and there's two ways of solving it. The, what's the uh, what's what's the standard solution that we we use in in general, to put uncertainty estimates on variables. No, there's this, this one standard algorithm that like everyone uses because it essentially always works. Yeah. Dropout. Yeah, or like, uh, like uh, uh, more precisely, no bootstrapping is what we usually use. No, we... we uh, or cross-validation. This, 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 that's yet another uh, error where you can say, I can ask how good my network is and get an estimate about it by doing cross-validation. I can use bootstrapping to say, get like a distribution of potential outputs. And why do I think that those are not adequate ways of measuring uncertainty? No, say, say, say Lyle goes and says, Let's fire the stats department. <laughs> we can just I, simply. Why is cross validation is not getting? It's not the answer that you're looking for. Why is it not the answer to the question? Yeah. Always out of sample. We assume we're testing on a ten percent. We've held out. That's random. So we're not cheating. It's an honest estimate of the accuracy of the model on what? Not on the same data, on data drawn from the same distribution, right? But what do statisticians want in terms of uncertainties? Yep. Comes interval on a on each estimate, right? This job will cost ten thousand and five dollars. Not my average accuracy is plus or minus five hundred bucks. Right, very different. Some estimates may be super accurate, some may be crappy. Right? 
Right, but, but we could still do bootstrapping with our neural network. Like I can train the same neural network 10,000 times and get the distribution over something that I estimate, say the price, right. and use that to quantify uncertainty. But I want uncertainty on a new data point I've never seen before. Yeah, you wanted to extrapolate. I wanted to extrapolate, that's the whole point. That's what I'm worried about, because someone's gonna come in with a new project I've never seen before, but I'm gonna estimate it. If but it's really uncertain, I want to hedge my bets. I, I, I agree with you, but also if we need to do it 10,000 times, well, like just train your deep neural network 10,000 times. It's a little bit of a it's hassle. Expensive, but you know, just money. <laughs> just money. Just, just energy. Just energy. We're warming the planet. It's Wind. too cold, cold. today. Um, so how would you do that if you wanted your neural network to do it instead of like the outside statistician to do it? I have a network, no, like, let, let's make it concrete. It, it predicts the price of a can of Monster. And uh, it was free, zero. It was free, that's just one data point. Maybe someone paid a lot more for it in the past. So we have the neural network, it predicts that, but you want an uncertainty on the, mess, uh, on the estimate. How would we go about it? Yeah. I thought this is very simple, but like, yeah, so so we could for hmm? Yeah, so 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 the idea, if I understand it right, is we could take a classifier that estimates something and a second classifier that estimates how sure we are about it. Is that right? Um, yeah, like when you classify something, you take the highest probability outcome. So like, right. you print that probability out. So if you're, if you're doing a classification problem, you get out not a zero one out of a neural net, you get an actual probability estimate, yeah. or at least a number that looks like one, right? You need a soft max, so you've got a probability. So for, for binary classification, maybe you did neural that already tells you it's uncertain. That's this, right? Yeah. Arguably, it's already built in there. So, uh, but let's say not it's a continuous one. We're, we're estimating value. dollar, uh, dollar, dollar amounts dollar. for that. That's we're not right. estimating if this is a can of monster. How would you go about it? Now, your solution works in the discrete case. What will we do in the continuous case? To be clear, what do we want? We want that it says, I think, yes. With tricky data, we want to estimate like, given some value of X. We want to predict what, say, the price of the monster is going to be. But we won't we'll probably only have one data point for one, for one value. <laughs> Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's make it concrete. We go to supermarket, lots of supermarkets, America wide, we take photographs of the cans and we scan the price of them. And now there's a new one, it's yellow and it says monster. And I'm like, no network, what do you think? How expensive is this thing? And it says $1,004. <laughs> um, how would it tell you, how would we know if, it, if it's possible that it's less than $900? Yeah. Okay, how would we know that variance? All the prices of the monster can. Right. Yes, so, so we could do it. We could say, let's take the 10 leading brands, calculate the mean, calculate the variance. But that's us doing it. How can we have a neural network do it by just loss function engineering? Yeah. That's exactly right. Look, here's the Gaussian. No, one over sigma square root two pi e to and then so on and so forth. You've all seen this a million times. So what if we make the neural network give me two things? It gives me a mean 
sigma, uh, mean mu, and this sigma, and we evaluate it according to this loss function, the log likelihood of that. Now the log likelihood, we all know, it has like minus log, minus log sigma, minus one half x minus mu squared over sigma squared. And then- But how do I get the sigma to train it up? I've got the- Yes, got so, so, so what we have, where's, where's my chalk? My finger at the computer. Yeah. Invisible chalk. Now, like we will now have a neural network. It takes access input, which is like the, the, the raw image, say. It gives me a mu and it gives me a sigma. And now both of them jointly give me the loss according to that log likelihood here. And then the network learns both of them. And let's get the intuition right about that. So, what happens if the neural network estimates for a case that the sigma is very large. Yes. Uh, I just wondered, uh, I don't have like a pretty big uh, assumption. So I, I understand what this uh, mark is like, but what if you have an environment where you have like a good three, four stack channel or something like that? How do you, where's the Gaussian supposed to be? Yes, great question. What this allows the neural network to do is estimate uh, the mean of something and estimate the standard deviation around it. But it's possible that the neural network could in principle represent that say things in our world tend to have integer prices. It couldn't represent that. But like if the prob uh, posterior probability distribution should look like this, then it could never deal with it. So for people who are remote and probably couldn't hear the question. If the data are actually not, the, the Y's are not Gaussian, then in fact, this whole thing will fail as an assumption. You might even do, for example, zero inflated. Assume it's either zero or something from a Gaussian. There are lots of models you might use if you were fancy. So- But people so, always assume Gaussian. Okay, now like we, we have this thing and you see how we could train it. We basically take a neural network, we train it, give us mean and variance. I like your point. Not like there's often cases where it's zero inflated. Not like the world is full of like free monster cans. And no, they're not paying me for like saying that here. So how would, what would we do in this case? No, imagine we believe it's a Gaussian, but also there's this thing where sometimes it's zero. What, how would we set up the network now? No, so, 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 so let me zoom out a little bit, just so that you all understand where we're going there. What we have here is we are building a hybrid between statistical thinking and deep learning thinking, where we say deep learning can give us estimates. Well, it can also therefore give us estimates of the variance of something that it estimates. What will we do in your case? Yes. <laughs> Abs absolutely, yes, we can say. We also estimate P0, which is the probability that it's gonna be exactly zero. And the fancy statistics term for this mixture model. <laughs> a mixture model, exactly. A mixture with some probability it's a free can, and with some probability it's a paid for can. The paid for cans have a Gaussian distribution. The free cans are free. And there's some probability, all of which needs to be estimated. So you can estimate any probability distribution in the log function, right? I'm not trying to kind of a general piece, but it doesn't have to always assume that everything should be your standard soft map for LP norm. No, like I, I'm, I'm just writing it out. We now would have. No, we can read them. It's remote. That's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for the online people, but like basically, in this case, we would have that the probability distribution is P zero times a delta function at zero plus the Gaussian, not like, and, and so we'd have like plus one minus P zero e to the minus X minus mu squared over two sigma squared. Okay, so, so basically there is this whole space. So none of the ideas that you learn in data science sees being important once you go into the space of deep learning. They can be hybridized in so many different ways, and they have to, because the real problem in deep learning is that interface 
into the real world. That's how deep learning projects fail. It's not that they fail because it doesn't optimize. I mean, like, sure it does, but you at least find out that it doesn't optimize. Whereas, is it a good fit for the business problem? Like, that is a totally different thing. Yeah. Um, could you take that to the to the extent of sort of like a, a career uh, career thing that's like a, a ton of programmers on the frontier and then you have to make a distribution? Yes. So if we want to represent arbitrary probability distributions, we can use a basis function set. In this case. We, we just allowed a Gaussian and like a zero inflation part of it. But you could say, well, I only believe that it's smooth, in which case you could do a Fourier transform uh, or you, a set of Fourier bases. But people usually think there's a complicated function from the image of the can going into the loss function and a fairly simple distribution over there. So when we do that, and people tend to make stronger assumptions about the loss function based on what they believe about the world, and weaker assumptions about the mapping from the input, say the image or the text, makes sense? So often you got this incredible nonlinearity from text or image, and then something relatively simple on the loss function. But the key point is to think about, do you think it's a Poisson arrival? Do you think it's something that's Gaussian? What do you believe? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so, so maybe, maybe let's see why the system will do the right thing. So if we have this as a likelihood, um, uh, and, and we, we will have the log probability, hold on, wait, wait, where is it here? Well, we don't have it on here, but like the log probability of this has two terms. It has that first term minus log sigma. That first part minus log sigma wants the sigma to be small. And then we have the x minus mu squared over sigma squared. It wants the sigma to be large. Now, not like, like those are the two components of, uh, of it. Perhaps kind of thing is confusing is that in fact, the mu and the sigma are outputs of a big neural net. So you have some image going in, running through a bunch of layers, giving out some hidden mu and sigma, giving the overall likelihood. So note that what deep learning really is doing for most of these problems is estimate the likelihood as a function of the image coming in. And in between are all your constant or whatever, right? So image in, mu and sigma going into the final piece, that's just instead of a soft mass, it's a different output function. Makes right. sense? And it makes sense because you think about it, many things like say counts, you don't get negative counts. So a soft max is sort of a stupid function of something that doesn't give you the count as an output, right? So depending if you want a zero one, a zero to infinity, a minus infinity plus infinity, all these different forms will suggest some different final layer. And kind of just being super clever about what the form is of the final layer, so it makes sense with statisticians. Right. But behind all but, that is a bunch of nonlinearity. <laughs> but, but it also makes sense for someone who wants to use it. So being yeah. So if you have a neural network doing any task, there will be some cases where it knows what the output is really quite well. And other cases where it would have to say, well, I have no idea what's going on here. It's the same thing with a human. And like I show you lots of images. Most of the time you're like, duh, this is a plane. And then sometimes you'll be like, maybe some animal of some kind. And by phrasing it like that, you basically enable you as a data scientist to read out how sure it is about something. And that is decision relevant. Not like, imagine you're Zillow or something. You want to know like what the house is about what, and you also want to know like how sure you're about it. So it's, a, it's, it's practically relevant. Here's an example from one of my favorite people in deep learning, Eric Jonas, rapid detection of NMR spectral properties with quantified uncertainty. Why is that important? If you try to do what molecules do chemistry-wise, some of them are just really easy and some of them are entirely hopeless. And knowing which is which totally helps. Why is this so cool? So Eric Jonas is 
using it to solve molecular inverse problems. So let me briefly highlight why, why that's so important. People in biology and chemistry, they take samples, put them into an NMR machine. It gives them a spectrum. What they really want is figure out what molecule is in there. Well, so far that was done basically by humans, basically guessing. He now has systems that use deep learning to basically puzzle together the things and he essentially get inverse NMR work. So you take that thing, it gives you the NMR spectra. I'm sure you've seen them in some publication. It looks like this. You have a long thing like look, looking like this, something like that. And he can then go from there and say, oh, look, this is C. This is C, C, C. Oh, well, I'm not good at my chemistry here. Um, oh, that's a totally imaginary equation for... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it turns out that uh, Lyle has real experience in chemistry and could have drawn you a really good one. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, and we're still in the loss function part of this. This one you probably saw, because I believe it might be in the tutorial. You want to embed faces in some space so that I can say, I take a face, I take a photograph, I, it goes to a neural network. The output of the neural network is a point in some high dimensional space, say 400 dimensional. And I want it so that faces of the same person are close to one another in that embedding space and faces of different people are far away from one another in that embedding space. What's the right loss function here? Yep. Yeah, yeah, we, we can do that. We can take an. Okay, so the question was can we just use, a, use an autoencoder where we can say basically there's a lot of information that is redundant in the real world? An autoencoder can basically go to a space where like a lot of the redundancy is taken out. And then maybe that is a better space. But for an autoencoder, I and Lyle taken from frontally are much more similar in all likelihood would be a great experiment than me being looking at you like this and me looking at you like this, no? like very different pixel value wise. The autoencoder would probably have very different values for that. So it goes into the right direction, but let's, let's take the problem seriously. What's the right loss function? Yeah. We could look at cosine similarity, but like think like data scientists. What, what, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? I, I explained what the problem is to you. You didn't hear that like be, behind my description of what the problem is, there was a loss function. I said, I want that in this high dimensional space, two photographs of the same person are close to one another and two photographs of different people are far away from one another. And so let's make, a, let's make a loss function out of there. What's the good loss function here? I give you a label data set. I take photographs of all students I ever taught, and I take three photos or 10 photos from all of you. I take 10 photos of you, 10 photos of Anka, 10 photos of everyone else who's in that room and everyone else. And what do I do then? Okay, similarity. How do I set up the loss function? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I love that idea. I take uh, the loss is the sum of all pairs of faces of the same person. I take, say, the two norm of that. I, and I want that the sum of those is as small as possible. Is that a good loss function? Of the same person. 
Yeah, it assumes that we have a label data set where we know that those photos are from the same class. Anka. Okay, yeah, triple loss is the right answer for that. So it's not enough to make pairs of pictures similar of the same person, because if we have that, then the right solution is just map everything on the zero vector. Not like if we map everything on the zero vector, we have solved. Every, everyone looks like everyone else, but it's not very useful. So we want both ideas. We want that four photographs of the same person, the output should be close to one another and two photos of different people should be far away from, the, uh, from one another. And here we see triple loss. We take an anchor, so-called anchor, we take the positive thing, it's the same one. We go, we want them to be similar. We take another actor, we want that to be different. And therefore we take between the three people, the different combinations, so like same with same, same with different. And so we produce a cost function that has like, we want the same ones to be similar and we want difference to be different. Can we add the con uh, constant there. That's a triplet loss function. But keep in mind, like triplet loss sounds like all fancy and so forth. It's a very intuitive idea. It, it, it was already in how I talked about it. It is, I want that in that space, all photos of the same person should be close to one another. All photos of different people should be far away from. Because in that space, I want to solve the identification problem. Okay, here, large scale online learning of image similarity through ranking. Wonderful paper, use the triplet loss. Others used it, a lot of other paper used it too, but this is one of the classic things. Anyone interested in that? Of course, after, the, after today, we will be sharing all the slides and you can like look at all the papers. Now, what would you do if the world was adversarial? No, so, so you know that you have that data set, but you know that I want you to believe I'm lying. Because what do you know? Like, the world likes like people who have chemistry and computer science background. And I really want to pass as one of those. So how would your strategy change in such an adversarial situation? What would you do like? I'm like suspicious. Really fine at the I try and ideally find adversarial examples. Ah, great so, idea. So I want to actually make the data set look like the thing like I'm trying to do. So rather than taking a random different person out of that whole bunch of people, because after all, most people are really different. That's too easy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like I'll, to try I'll to find it. I'll yeah. be walking, I'll be like shaving my hair. Well, you can wear a cap. Uh, wear a cap, a yeah. Uh, absolutely, glasses. yeah, yeah, yeah. Change your glasses. So I try and find examples that were good adversarial examples. In fact, I'd probably write a neural net to identify, identify and I've not seen the answer, I don't know. <laughs> Great. Identify adversarial examples. And, and the answer's not that. in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you can go for it. Uh, yes, exactly. We would want to try and get a hold of adversarial uh, data. We might also want to build in human knowledge. Now, like, it's much harder to do something about regions where skin color is visible than, say, where clothing is visible. It would be very cheap for me to put on, like, gray sweater, black T-shirt. And I, I want to give you an example of where we did it. So my lab did uh, identification of uh, of, so when people have motion tracking, I mean, who's using a Fitbit in this room? Okay, there's, there's no health insurers that kind of want to give you money for like, or like make it cheaper for you because you walk out so much. And obviously people get the idea, let's put it on a dock or let's just shake it to get those extra points. What our lab did is we basically paid people to try and cheat our systems. And we did multiple iterations. We produced lots of Lyle's kind of adversarial data. And now it's effectively impossible to cheat that thing. And we've had people in this department who have hired lots of students come and meet, come put on a wig, come put on a mask, put on a fake nose, 
try a bunch of things, and then they build up a data set. That's, that's, that's right. That would be a cool student project, too. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun yeah. You bring in lots of people, try and make them Big fool a classifier. Those are the clown noses, colored glasses. Yeah, and here's an example. How would you deal with masks? Huh? Now everyone wears masks. Uh, no one has a good big labeled data set of triple loss things of people with masks. What would you do? No, it's a transfer learning problem in a way. We have a big data set from a similar domain, which is faces of people not wearing masks. And now we want to have people faces wearing masks. It's kind of difficult. Yeah. Yeah, you can, for example, dem uh, demand that any change to faces in this area can't affect the output. You can add arbitrary masks over it and basically see that it doesn't change anymore. And there's a fair amount of work in vision on occlusion, where they take a real label data set and they occlude and block out parts of it. So a mask is a very particular weird form of occlusion, but this happens a lot in recognizing stuff in the real world. You're trying to recognize a phone, but part of it is occluded. And if you don't have enough data sets with partially occluded phones, all you do is put a big square block in front of them and then retrain. Right, so that's a different adversarial version. Okay, cool. But, but, but I hope you get what, what I'm driving at with today's lecture. The interesting things are always at the interface. What is it that we want to get? What is it that we can assume about the domain? Um, let me briefly mention ethics. Ethics hasn't made it much into the live lectures, which is a bit of a mistake, but I just don't have good materials for that. Imagine we could do it. Is that, is that cool? I built something that like with the principles we just talked about, it recognizes everyone if they wear a mask or not. Now, at the top computer science conference today, they now demand ethics statements. They are like, okay, tell me if the thing that you do is cool or if there's any problems with it ethically. What would we write into that section? Yeah. I feel like every tool, uh, like Great. So you write your ethics statement. Well, anything has positive and negative things. Uh, are they going to be happy with it? No, they, they now have special ethics reviewers. They, they look at every paper. They're like, okay, it's this ethic here, potentially problematic. What will the reviewers say about it? Like, well, everything has good and bad uses. Yes. Yes, exactly. No, like, it's pretty clear what the abuses, the potential abuses of it are. Not like people have been wearing masks to rob banks from time immemorial. And, um, and so there's clearly uh, the effect that people will no longer be able to hide their identity by wearing masks. Now, if this is a problem or not, depends on the usage. And you're right, not like tools by themselves aren't good or bad, but when we develop those tools, we want to be acutely aware of the negative potential side effects. And there's plenty of them if we can find out people. Now, like, there's the good ones, we can find the criminals. There's the bad ones, we can find the dissidents. We can find people who might be from another country. We might find people who just for private reason don't want to be recognized. We might be in a situation where like, now imagine you could figure out the faces of everyone build a great detector, that person's having an affair. And then you have like an algorithm that sends them like, hey, send us thousand dollars and we'll forget about this thing. Otherwise, like, you have such a nice family. It would be a shame if like they get angry at you. So basically, yeah, there's like lots and lots and lots of problems on the privacy side of that. 
and it's something that we, we as society haven't dealt with. Like, there are lots of pragmatic things we can do with that information. Um, here's, here's yet another lost function. Yeah. So you want to build a system that converts summer pictures to winter pictures. You're like one of these skiers. You're like, okay, I only like scenes if there's snow and because I really like skiing everywhere. Um, so uh, what would be a good loss function? Yeah. Absolutely, and I'll be I'll go even further. I give you a whole database of like snow images and a whole database of like normal images. What would you what 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 would you use? Not like let's let, let's let's already put on what like the standard GAN ideas. Are. Now the standard GAN ideas is I want the photos that my system is drawing to look like photos. In fact, I want the winter photos that it's drawing to look like winter photos and the summer photos that it might be drawing like summer photos. So there's those cost functions that would always be part in, an, in a system that generates something. Now we want generators to produce high probability samples. We want generators to sample properly from the distribution that is there. But what else could we use? Let's think about summer and winter. What, what's the special property of them? Yeah? Yes, yes, that has to be part of that, where you can say, I, I, I take this summer image, I convert it to a win winter image, it now needs to look like a winter image. Got it. Like that's definitely part of the loss function. Um, there's something else that we can get a lot of my bad shadow. Yeah. Kind of like Yeah, we could do that. But there would be. If I have a pair of images, they should be similar. Now the winter image will share still the same buildings and trees in that image. So keep in mind that when snow falls, when winter comes, snow falls, it converts the world into a winter scene, but then it, it evaporates eventually and it goes and is back to a summer scene. Can we use that somehow? Yes, yes, we could. But what we can do here is we can use what's called cycle loss, which is if I take a winter image, I make it into a summer image, and I make it back into a winter image, it should just like look like the original winter image. Why is that such a cool loss function? Well, it gives you a lot, a lot of data that you can have about that. It kind of forces you to not lose anything while you go through that circle. And so this is the cycle gun loss. Not like you go from acts to you go from winter to summer and back to winter, and it should be close to one another. They call it cycle consistency loss. Very cool set of papers. You can go from zebras to horses, from summer to winter, and so on and so forth. Unpaired image to image translation using cycle consistent adversary. But it's basically just a very obvious idea about the cost function. A lot of the big innovation, and it's a super big paper, everyone's using it. The idea is often just to build common sense into loss functions. I have to say, as a language guide, the standard trick in Latin translation. Translate from English to Chinese, translate from Chinese back to English. If you're lucky, you get something that looks pretty similar. If not, you mess up. So this back translation, as we call it, is a very similar cycle loss type thing 
Yeah, and let me guess, it was invented way before long these scan things. A long, 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 long time right. was before. Was under manual <laughs> translation, that was a standard. You get someone who's a native speaker of Chinese to do the Chinese translation, the English native speaker to go back to English, and you check to see how well it works. So you're telling me that this idea Not really new. is hundreds of years old. Well, something older than us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but like... But good. So good. No, but 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 you you but what I want to implore on you is the things that make you good at deep learning and that make you good as a data scientist is not the techniques. Anyone can optimize these things. Not like and, and that's what the notebook stuff about. It's the level to which you can kind of bring common sense into that framework. The thing that distinguishes a good machine learning system from a bad one is just that the good one uses what we know about the domain back then. And of course, it needs to always be good, well done well. But okay, here we get to the second part. We won't get very far in it. Let's talk about transform data. So you're an MD, you've been staring at X-ray images for a really long time, and you're really great at saying, okay, that image looks like it, it's, it's probably lung cancer. Um, how would you approach that deep learning project? No, no, no. And like, you're then that like young data science hotshot that goes like, yeah, yeah, doctor, we can like build a system that helps you with that. And so you go in there and you're like, yeah, let's, let's build a deep learning system that does it. What, how would you go about data? No, let's, uh, let's, let's say we start with that situation that is very typical. We have a couple of very expensive MDs who stared at 1,000 images of people, 500 of which have like a cancer somewhere on it, and 500 don't. And for the 500 that I have, I have like a little box drawn around like where the cancer is. That's a data set. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's say, uh, let's say we have 10,000, we go away from the 500, 500 that I said, but we have 10,000 healthy x-rays of like lungs to stand that test. And we have thousand of them, uh, uh, we have thousand of them that do contain a cancer. What, how would we take care of the class imbalance? Do we need to take care of the class imbalance? What's the class imbalance going to do to us? No, like, let's say we take the same kind of classifier, we train it on our 500, 500 data set, versus we train it on the 10,000, 2,000 data set. What's going to be different between those two classifiers? Yeah. That, yeah, there's a great, like a treasure trove of great answers. So, uh, so if the if, if the goal of our algorithm is to maximize the percent of uh, percent correct, um, what is the optimal solution to that? And I know you know it, but like, yeah. Okay, I, yeah, I agree, agree with pre-training, but let, let, let's, let's, uh, I'll get to transfer learning in just a second, but let, let, let's briefly go back to class imbalance. Um, if the goal was, if we're in such a situation like cancer image recognition, we have a 10 to one class imbalance, 
and we optimize the percent correct. So the output of our classifier is binary, yes or no. What's going to be the optimal solution? Yeah. <laughs> Predict all negatives. It's very rare that we have methods that give us much more than like a 10 to 1 uh, the, the quality of information. Although I don't, I don't know that field too well. Maybe, maybe they can sometimes get it very well, but like in the vast majority of cases, we do that. So what would be the right loss function to deal with it? Yeah, that's, that's what she mentioned. We could assign different, uh, different weights, but that is, but what would be a good cost function? Now, like in a way, in a way it's true, no? like that the probability, if the class imbalance makes it very likely that you don't have cancer, then the probability, even given that image that you actually do have cancer, is still very small. So in a way, that answer that it's very unlikely you have cancer, even after having seen this highly suspicious thing in your lung, the right answer might still be like, yeah, you're like kind of 50-50. So in a way, like you can say you might want to correct for it, but in a way you want to, it's good. So what do we do when we have high class amounts? We could use the F1 score, that's right. So the F1 score in a way helps us deal with class imbalance because as we go through it, um, we basically, it really matters that we get it right, even in the areas where, uh, even, even in the case of class imbalance. So yes, that, uh, that's definitely gonna be part of what we'll be doing. What will we use as loss function when we train on your network? Okay, can I explain what the F1 score is? So, um, how to best describe that? So, so here's, the, here's the problem. Imagine 90% don't have cancer. I'll report what the results are. And the result is my algorithm gets 90% correct. In that case, I'll be celebrating, hooray, 90% correct. And if you look through medical machine learning, it's full of papers that do that. But of course, it's entirely nonsensical. We just celebrate that we have class imbalance. So what we often do is we, uh, is we now want a score that like allows us to, to be, be more tolerant to that. Um, and now what we can do is we can say, there's a threshold, no? and I can change that threshold. The threshold says, uh, maybe I can't call, call everyone who has more than 10% probability assigned by the algorithm to have cancer, more than 20%, and so, and so on. So what we can say is we have on this axis, the percent uh, true positives. Okay, now I'm getting su super confused about what we have on the two axes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know that by heart? Um, now, what you want to do is sort everyone from being most likely to have cancer to being least likely to have cancer. According to the algorithm. According to the algorithm's prediction. And then what's going to happen is that you're going to gradually take your threshold, pick the one most likely person, then the two most, then the three, then the four most. No, no, no. We, what's, what's on that axis? That's the, so that's the is, main, uh, main question. This is the number predicted or percent predicted to have cancer. And this is the number or percent that actually have cancer. If you are randomly guessing, you have a 50-50 line, 45 degrees. You're going to randomly pick people. If you're doing better than that, you get your famous, what do you call it? ROC, receiver operator characteristic curve. ROC curve and says, for this threshold, if I'd have guessed at random, I'd have gotten this many people with cancer, but in fact, in reality, I've got that many people with cancer. And then you could actually say, what I really care about often is the area under the curve, AUC. Sometimes you pick some point on this curve which balances precision and recall. I'm as concerned about the cost of missing people as of finding them. Um, and we'll have some of the F1 score. Or I could be that I'm a doctor and I really want to be, what, super accurate. I'm happy to miss lots of people. That's probably the wrong place to be. 
But yeah, often, they, I want the doctors to be here. You want the doctors to be here. Well, but do you? This one just says, hey, everybody's got cancer. You got breast <laughs> cancer there, you got lung cancer on there. But no, you don't want the doctor over here. This is terrible. You're now being treated for lung cancer, which you don't have. But, but I, I might want to like include, like I might want to be here and include a lot of too many people. It's unclear where you want to be. That's a doctor loss function. Where do you want to be on the curve? But note there are two pieces and one other piece. I mean, we didn't end, we're sort of at time. But often there are two different loss functions. There's a loss function for training the deep learning model, which might be a standard log likelihood, soft max based cross entropy. And then you say at the end of the day, how willing am I to miss lots of people with cancer? How willing am I to include people without it? And you'll pick a decision threshold and say, here's my cutoff. I'm going to call everybody on this side cancer, everyone there. That will give me some number of false positives and false negatives. So note this option on the one hand, train with your standard cross entropy loss, then pick the threshold, which is mostly done. Or increasingly, people say, hey, this is the trade off between positive and negative errors. I will now put that as my loss function and just pay the set on that. Yeah, but, but, but maybe to also be clear what the interpretation is. Yeah. So if we have high AUC, it means that regardless of where you put your threshold, on average, you, you are better than by just guessing. Um, so if, if your algorithm sees absolutely nothing, it's basically just random, regardless the imbalance, it will always be 0.5. You know? Like everything, you will just be on that axis here. If you start picking up on data, it kind of, uh, it kind of moves up further. So it basically measures, are you picking up data from reality? And we're at time. We should we're stop. At time. It's so time to stop. We can do more of these like after um, spring break. So, 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 so hold on. Um, we have, let, let's finish this in one minute. Yes. Yeah. So what will you have? You have that data, and that is important. But you also already mentioned it. No, like we will want to pre-train. It turns out that there's lots of aspects that we can learn from recognizing dogs and cats that carries over to cancer, where you can say, well, like things in the real world, they're sometimes a little squishy. If they move a little, it's still the same thing. There's kind of lots of things that is shared between recognizing objects and recognizing cancers. So therefore, the idea is you pre-train on other regular images. A lot of uh, systems, for example, do cancer detection and pre-train on ImageNet because there you have a lot of data, talk millions of data points, whereas for actual cancer cases, you will rather have like thousands. And here's an example, human computer collaboration for skin cancer recognition. They do this kind of pre-training, but they also collaborate effectively with doctors. And um, yes, and this is where we'll end for today. Thanks so much. And thanks for participating, everyone. That was great fun.